Welcome into the Illini Inquirer podcast, and let's talk some Illini basketball. And he's all smiles because he's about to get on the road here in July. And uh, Illinois starts July off with a bang, and Chester Frazier gets his first recruiting win. And Brad Underwood can puff his chest out a little bit after losing a couple assistants. He can still land some really good talent. Uh, Derek Piper's on to talk about Sincere Harris, the newest Illini commit, a four-star guard out of Ohio. Very familiar school, St. Uh, St. Vincent st mary's where lebron james came out of school uh but derek um that turned around pretty quickly sincere harris like a, an offer in mid-june of visits and all of a sudden they're able to land him impressive by chester frazier brad underwood and the line staff yeah absolutely had some fireworks before the fourth uh i know here in muhammad we've had him about for about a month now and probably the same all, all around the country but uh, some recruiting fireworks here for the staff before the AAU scene. And uh, like you said, a very nice first get for Chester Frazier, uh, putting his stamp on this 2022 class. And uh, Sincere Harris came to campus middle of June for a visit, got an offer at that point in time, someone that they had targeted as a top 100 talent, someone that they uh, really like, because it's going to be a guard heavy class. It's going to be quite a few guards when you have Trent Frazier, Alfonso Plummer, Demonte Williams all gone, Curbelo. Uh, we'll see about him as far as at the end of this season or next season, there's a feeling, you know, at most you probably get two more seasons out of him. So uh, to get sincere uh, locked up before the AAU stretch here was, I, I think, a pretty big deal. When you look at a 6-3 combo guard, it's a really nice lefty sh stroke from the perimeter and ability to do quite a bit off the bounce. He's pretty shifty, pretty quick. Uh, and I see him as a two-way impact player. He's got really long arms an active defender and can really uh, move very, very well laterally. So uh, they kind of saw him as a taller version of a Trent Frazier. Maybe you see a little bit of a, if you look in the big 10, maybe an Al Durham a little bit, mm. uh, you know, that, that taller, longer lefty uh, who can play on or off the ball. So uh, he took visits to Illinois, Cincinnati and Xavier and Illinois was able to not lock that thing up. Uh, a lefty uh, is is Lance Habe going crazy about that? How many lefties do we have on the team now, Derek? I, I feel like we've heard lefties here recently. Yeah, we've got Pods, obviously Trent Plummer. Uh, is Payne a lefty? We, we've gotten a lot. Like, I, I just remember dating back to Jalen Coleman Lands and, and Kendrick Nunn. It felt like those were kind of random, you know, really exceptions to the rule, but it feels like we're getting a lot of lefties here on the team. So I don't know, scouting report, how much that helps you yeah. um, until somebody kind of figures it out and the players figure it out. But all right. So why did he become a, a quick priority here, Derek? You mentioned they do need guards in this class. I think we know if they lost Curbella, they'd certainly need a lead guard. Um, but last last class, it felt like the wing class. This class, obviously, they need some front court help. But why why did Sincere Harris, especially um, with Reggie Bass already on board, why did he become such a priority? I think when you you look at the fact, as I mentioned, some of those names, and obviously you throw in Io this this offseason, Adam Miller as guys that uh, are no longer in the mix. You really need to revamp that backcourt for the future, restock it, I should say, and um, just having someone that can be dynamic on or off the ball, someone that can create his own shot and need to have a, a stable of guards, which has been the recipe to success for Brown Underwood here in recent seasons, is just having a number of really good guards that can rotate in and, and play, you know, three guys potentially at one time that can, can handle the ball and do some things. So uh, they have thought in their minds they're going to take – three guards, maybe a wing with that or a bigger guard, depending on kind of how things shake out with a, a Cam Whitmore or an AJ store uh, to go and then need a big or two uh, in that class as well. So it's going to be a pretty big class. And, and you did mention Reggie Bass and, and pairing him, uh, those two together. I don't know. Reggie Bass's situation is a little interesting. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if if he doesn't end up in the, in the Illinois class at the end of the day, uh, to be completely honest with you, uh, it's something that maybe you should, people should monitor out here, but uh, since Harris and Jaden Epps are two guys that they really looked at and said, Hey, we got to get at least one of these guys just knowing, you know, combo guard, they can score, they can again, do some things off the dribble. They said, we got to get one of those guys, maybe both and, and to get sincere on board now and still have a chance with Epps who's got UConn, Kansas, and they had him on campus in June. Uh, that's kind of their approach with that. 
Yeah, how much do you see this guy? Can he can Sincere Harris eventually can he be a, a, a bigger point guard for you? Like is 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 that potentially his future, or do you see him kind of as the second primary ball handler? I would say probably the second primary ball handler. He's shown that he can play in pick and rolls and that he can be operating in that in that capacity as far as pushing in transition. Uh, similar to Trent, uh, as we've seen. I know that when Io was on the court, he was often a spot-up guy, and, and he personally, with his game, wanted to do more off the dribble. Um, but I think that there would be moments where you could play him in pick and rolls. Um, but you would look at probably a guy like Epps, uh, obviously if Curbelo's still here, as being that would be the lead guard and just having someone that can can be dynamic with the ball but probably not you know your number one ball handler. So you mentioned Jaden Epps here a couple of times, former Providence commit. Um, Illinois is one of his top schools. He visited here, took a couple of official visits uh, as well. I believe Kansas was one of his recent official visits. Is it safe to say that's that's the priority um, t- main guard target moving forward? And, and if so, why Jaden Epps? What makes him their top guy there? Yeah, he's, he's definitely their guy as far as guards. And another one that Chester Frazier – had a connection to or just built a really nice relationship and, and recruited him for a while pro- prior to him committing to Providence. Uh, and they offered him right away after he decommitted back in May. And like you said, took officials to UConn, NC State, and Kansas. It's thought to be that Kansas would be the toughest of the competition to try to be able to beat them out for, for Epps. But uh, he took an unofficial to Illinois. And to your question of what he brings to the table, he's just another really – I mean, he's, he's a great scorer, just fantastic off the dribble, very, very quick and get to the rim. I mean, he, he models his game off of a Damian Lillard. And it, he, again, we, we say big names like that and you, it's like, well, okay. Uh, but play style and just can get a bucket from anywhere. That's kind of his, his makeup as a player. And they have really pressed the gas with him and are trying to get him back on campus for an official visit during the fall semester. And they're, they're very much in play there. So would, would the ideal setup be, I mean, you mentioned kind of three guards slash maybe one of them a wing here, like a Sincere Harris, Jaden Epps, Jaden Shoot slash Store, or Sincere Harris, Reggie Bass, like Store, like is that kind of their dream is, is a combination of those kind of guys? Yeah, absolutely. I think the dream would probably be an Epps, Harris, Shoot, uh, and then one of Cam Whitmore, the who's blowing up as a wing coming from the Baltimore area, six foot six, that's really athletic or an AJ store. Uh, so you go with those three guards and then a wing or bigger guard and store, and then try to go Cam Corrin, Braden Huff, uh, and, and try to maybe find a five man as well. So uh, that's kind of the, the line of thinking is that, that, th- that stable of three guards and then uh, someone that's bigger on the perimeter as well. I know everybody, like, because I'm doing this, I'm rushing to my scholarship grid of, of basketball. I'm like, there's that many scholarships in this class. And, yes, they still have three open at this point, and we know there's always attrition. So this could be um, a six-person class. Like you're talking about, Derek, maybe a transfer is in there at some point. But, yeah, this is going to be a big, pretty big class. I know a lot of us are, are focused on the front court, Derek, because you lose a guy like Kofi Coburn, whether it's now or – we'll talk about that – or – uh, after next year, um, you know, and you still have that hole at the four, at least for now, we'll see what happens with Dawson Garcia as well, but they obviously need more in the front court. And, and it feels like the two names you keep bringing up the most, understandably so, um, are Braden Huff, who this staff has really pushed the gas on, and Cameron Corn, who just visited campus. Um, I imagine those are one and two on, on the priority board for them. Yeah, for sure. Guys that Huff absolutely is that power forward six foot nine uh very very skilled and, and they offered him in june and and like you said from the moment they offered they've really tried to go deep on that one and uh continue to develop the relationship with him with mike mullins get him on campus which they did uh, late in that month and they are very high on him and, and really like his skill set and what he can be offensively in particular just to put on the deck and shoot it um, and you'll need to get him stronger and, and there will be some concerns that are just question marks as far as rebounding and, you know, just athleticism type stuff with, with defense. But it's a give and take that you will you've seen work with uh, Frank Kaminsky, Ethan Happ, that kind of big man has killed you for a, a long time. 
Well, even for me, like, I mean, we keep mentioning Wisconsin guys, but Wisconsin was the first to offer him, right? And, like, I know they hadn't turned out quite last year, but Micah Potter was a really good player. Um, and Huff seems to have some similarities there, but that kind of player where, where Potter, you put him up against, you know, a Trace Jackson Davis on defense, maybe he gets beat up a little bit, but a lot of people do. But offensively, he just brings so much to the table. Yeah, absolutely. He really space the floor, modern big man that, um, yeah, is a very big threat as far as uh, what you're able to do, uh, pick and pop, put the ball in his hands, play make. And then Corin is – it'll be interesting to see how they judge that with – would they take him and Huff? Do they see Corin maybe more as a four versus a five? Now, he's he's listed as a five, and he's really long. He's just very skinny and slender at this point and would prefer uh, offensively to play on the perimeter as a jump shooter, a uh, very nice pure stroke, uh, but also can to get her up above the rim and finish uh, and then block shots at the other end. So uh, Chester is – really really deep in that one and if you read some of his comments that he said about Chester and just the relationship that he has the relationship that Chester's built with his family uh, I mean he's already taken an official visit here in Champaign that was the first of the cycle for Brad Underwood and staff so uh, major priority those two and there's some other bigs in the mix uh, but I think when you think about the traction that they've been able to get coupled with how bad they want them those are the two that really come to mind first. Derek, before we get to the transfer portal and the the immediate roster here for 2021, 2022, I'm just wondering, do you have any takeaways yet? I mean, I know we don't have a full staff quite yet, uh, official, and maybe that'll actually happen this month. But, like, I mean, Chester Frazier's getting after it. I think everybody can see that. And I think Brad is giving him a lot of leeway and, and just, hey, who do you like? Let's go get them. How do they fit us? It's, and Brad's always kind of done that, it seems like. Um, but but Jeff Alexander, I mean, seems to really like Braden Huff, and Brad Underwood certainly likes him a lot. Like, what have you learned about those three working together as a recruiting staff so far? I would say initial in indications have been very positive when you think about what Chester's been able to bring in, Jeff. I, I think Jeff's doing a very good job uh, with the Wolves program again um, and also has some ties to Tennessee, to Memphis. I think he'll recruit the Brad Beal program very well. He's done a good job, a really good job, actually, with Jeremy Fears uh, as, as in that program and an in-state kid. Uh, so I, I think that his relationships, uh, there are some that are pre-existing that uh, he is being able to utilize, but also he just uh, is very personable. Uh, and both guys are just grinders. Like, th those guys work their butts off. And Chester is... He's been a workhorse. Like he's had to carry a fairly heavy load here while Brad has figured out that third spot. And um, even before Jeff got announced, there was just a lot on Chester to lay the groundwork or just kind of make that transfer uh, to the 2022 class to put them in a position to have a number of options and to set up visits and all that. And, and Chester just kind of, when you talk to people around the program or just those that, that know him, like, he is, as a recruiter or just a coach, the same guy he was as a player, just really tough, works really hard. Not a whole lot has been just handed to him, but he's gone out there with kind of that competitive edge, and he just wants to beat people. And he's got the pride of wearing the Illinois eye now and knows that where they're coming off of as far as a season, uh, he, he's got a swagger to him, and, yeah. and he he should. Like, he, he's out there and, and doing really well, and you just hear a couple of some really good targets saying, hey, I'm considering Illinois because the relationship I have with Chester. And I think that says a lot about him. Yeah. And uh, listen, like it, it's good for Chester to get his name out there. Right. I mean, he's gonna be a head coach at some point, but like, I, I, when this hire initially happened, I thought that's really solid, right? Like that, that's a good hire. I think I even underrated knowing Chester, knowing what recruiting for your alma mater is, but we didn't see him or we didn't keep tabs on how he recruited at, at Virginia tech as closely who he got into battles for. And while he got in trouble, because we tweeted out the quote and maybe he didn't like that we tweeted out, but it was the right quote. It was this job is sexier. And it is, it is sexier than Kansas state. It is sexier than Virginia tech taking nothing away from those programs and their recent success, which has been better than Illinois until the last two years. This is a bigger job and it's his alma mater and you're in on top 100 recruits all the time. And sincere Harris, at least by 24 seven sports is a top one I recruit. That's a nice first get for him. And he's just in on so many of these. And it seems like the relationships have been there for a long time. 
Like, and now he can actually potentially land these kids uh, at Illinois when maybe that was really difficult at Virginia Tech. So I think this is going to work out well for both sides. Like, I think Chester loves to be here and it's his alma mater. And I think, you know, he'll be here until he's a head coach. But I, I think this is going to work out well for Brad too. Like, Chester's getting paid a lot. He's got a, he's got a lot of freedom to, to do his job here. And, and he can obviously raise his Q rating. But I think this is going to work out for Brad as well. Yeah, it certainly certainly seems like it so far. And again, we are going to have to see how they close the, the rest of this class. But he's given them some really good chances here uh, going forward. And and like you said, you mentioned connections like Dawson Garcia. Who we're going to talk a little bit about Chester had a pre-existing connection that, that helped Illinois get in there and you got a stealthy first visit. And you're very much in the mix. So he's he's working it and he's got some things going, which is exciting for Illinois. That's a nice tease into our next segment, Derek. Let's talk about the transfer portal because, boy, this is going to change the outlook completely uh, for Illinois for the 21-22 season. Let's talk about Dawson Garcia and the big one, Kofi Coburn. We come back on the Illini Inquirer podcast. All right, I think two of the top four transfers on the market are considering the University of Illinois. And you wonder if they're mutually exclusive, but it doesn't seem that way. Um, so the possibilities here are endless for Illinois. Either their front court will be very, very thin and have some issues and probably keep them from contending truthfully in the Big Ten, uh, or they have the best front court potentially in Illinois history, <laughs> or they get one of the two and are a factor uh, in the Big Ten. But let's start with Kofi Coburn, Derek. We're recording this late July 5th, uh, Monday, but Kofi has a big decision to make on Wednesday, whether to stay pro or stay in college, and then he'll have a decision after that whether to stay at Illinois or go elsewhere. But what do you think? Like, uh, it, it feels like he is coming back to college. I mean, I don't think you enter the transfer portal unless – you are seriously considering that and almost like that is your, that is your most likely path. Right. And we'll get that answer officially by Wednesday. Uh, I know that there has been some pushback throughout the process. I mean, clearly when Kofi says I'm hundred percent staying in, that was his intention. And I, I think that ideally, I mean, it's obvious that he would want to stay in the draft and pursue that opportunity to just, with the NIL changing the game here, it's no longer like Kofi wait for the money for another year. Like just wait it out. It'll be there at at the end of the the line. There's some, some real feedback and and real evidence here for Illinois and for others that are now in this mix that, Hey, the the money's actually in college for you. Like there's maybe more money in college for you than going to the G league and what that's going to look like. So that seems to be trending everything towards going back to college. Now, the only thing I would say maybe is if if he doesn't want to deal with the NCAA and having to, to go through the waiver process, uh, which, again, I, I don't think – we talked about it late last week. They wouldn't bar one of the best players in college basketball from doing something that is very similar to NIL. I mean, the suspension – small, whatever it may be. Yeah, because he, because he sold some gear before NIL gear, right. became anything. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then, I mean, you got to go to class for another year, but hey, there's a, there's a lot it's of one thing I think people underrate a little bit is like some of these guys don't want to stay in college No, nah. Like, but now that there's money in college, like Kofi, if the NIL wasn't a thing, I, I, I think he's staying pro and he's just going, Hey, I'm going to be in the G league. I'll be overseas, whatever. Uh, but yeah, I think NIL, especially for him, Derek, like, I don't think we're not seeing a bunch of like huge deals right away. Right. And I think most of us kind of understood for some of these guys, they can make a little money, right? If they want to do a cameo. And, and But for most people that are student athletes, I don't think a lot of football players are going to make a lot of money off this at, at Illinois unless they become big. But like Andre Corbello is different. Like Andre could probably make six figures this year if he really wants to. Trent Frazier could probably make tens of thousands of dollars if he really wants to. But Kofi's a, a different animal. I mean, Io probably would have made – hundreds of thousands of dollars last year. And I think Kofi would make hundreds of thousands of dollars as a college basketball player. If he plays his cards, right. If he does the right things and you know, if he gets the right marketing deal, but um, he's just so unique in college basketball. Why wouldn't he? I mean, he's great personality. He's seven foot, 290 pounds, a shack of college basketball playing at one of the, you know, most prestigious basketball programs like, I just think it makes so much sense. And, and to me, again, this is why I said it last week, like it makes so much sense for him to return to Illinois 
because of the brand he has already already built here. But yeah, I mean, for him, makes makes more even more sense now to to come back to college rather than even go pro and make potentially what fifty to seventy grand in the G League or something like that. Right, absolutely. I agree with everything you just said. And, and I mean, he's got he's got the baby shack thing going on, uh, and I I think he's shown us here, especially last season, just um, very personable, very um, uh, very likable, yes. uh, and, and great smile and all of that. So I, I think that I think he could make a lot of money, and he's being told that. And and Illinois has, that NIL team has run some projections on, hey, this is what Io we think would have made last year, and it was like three four hundred thousand dollars just based on kind of social media following and just kind of the market that Illinois is in the reach to Chicago that obviously he would have and I think Kofi could still tap into that as well and I think there are not he would be one of the national nationally known uh players in the sport I mean he if I'm Andre Curbelo Derek I'm telling him come back can you imagine the commercials like they could do national commercial I'm not like they are one of the most intriguing pairs in college basketball, like they could team up together and the size discrepancy on a commercial or, you know what I mean? Like even social media campaign uh, that they could do. And plus, you know, with both of them being from the Caribbean, you know, I know Andre is an American citizen and Kofi is not like Kofi being from Jamaica, Andre being like, it's just, it's, there's so much there, there, (laughs) like there is so much uh, if I am Andre, I am like Kofi. We do this together, man. We do it right. We're gonna make a lot of money here and win a lot of games and maybe do what we thought we do last did last year. Yeah, that's a great point. Poppy Curbelo, King Kofi, uh, those two could both Prince be. Prince Curbelo, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Kofi's gonna be preseason All American, and Curbelo's gonna have a chance to to work himself into the mix in the postseason as far as you know. All, all big 10 all that kind of deal but i think illinois also is the other pieces provide illinois enough of a chance to be relevant enough if kofi comes back it's not like kofi's coming back and this is going to be a bubble team or right. illinois is not going to be a focal point in the big 10 like they would still very much be that and that would that would is is also part of the sell to kofi as well if, if kofi came back if we're talking top in the big 10 it's michigan purdue because I think Jaden Ivey is going to be one of the stars in the Big Ten. Michigan, Purdue, Illinois, right? Yeah. Like Ohio State's going to be really good with EJ Liddell, and they got some good talent, but losing Dwayne Washington really hurts. Like, um, you know, Maryland. Maryland's up there. It's, a, it's, been a, it's been a rough couple of days for Maryland, losing Morcel to, to Marquette, and now uh, Aaron Wiggins staying in the draft, which I think a lot of people are surprised by. So I, I think that is – if Kofi came back – top three team like they maybe i had i'm thinking purdue potentially is my number one team in the big 10 because michigan's gonna be so young but if illinois gets kofi back i think illinois and purdue are very similar yep i would i fully agree with that and yeah purdue would be right up there illinois and then of course if you were to get a dawson garcia to pair that down low a four and five man uh which we're going to talk about here uh but yeah I, i think that to answer your your first question um, I think Illinois had some really encouraging talks over the weekend with Kofi. I think that you still got to worry about a, a Kentucky just based on, as we talked about late in the week, just the tie to Antigua, although that is a little bit messy as far as what he said to Illinois on the way out, maybe just his communication with Kofi after he left and went to Kentucky. There, You could say that, I don't know if you could frame it entirely on like tampering, but there was a relationship that continued once he was with Kentucky that uh, that's kind of all in the mix and on the table. And you got Cal wanting to, wanting to continue to load up. I know Jalen Duran is, is one that, that they're looking at as well as a five-star reclass. Um, so that, that is on the table, but I think here's what I would college, say to that. Here's what I would say to that. Like Brad Underwood can cannot count on Orlando Antigua's word though. I'm not, I'm not dis- like disparaging right. Orlando for that. Right. Because I, I, my interactions with Orlando have only been great. And I know yours as well, but like Orlando is, his loyalty is no longer to Brad. <laughs> like it is, yeah. He is getting paid by John Kelfar in Kentucky to do what he has to do to win games there. And, and Kofi, obviously now in the portal, be a huge piece for anybody. Um, so I, I can't disparage Orlando that much if he was recruiting him. I'm sure he is, but um, it just still doesn't make sense to me, Derek, why, why he'd go there as opposed to where he's already got this brand. He's playing with 
probably a better point guard than he'd play with at Kentucky, at least for his sake. Maybe there's a guy who's going to get drafted higher than Andre Curbelo, uh, but also just, you know, Illinois can be as good as Kentucky next year. Yeah. You know, I, I know Orlando Antigua is not his big man coach anymore, but he knows Jeff Alexander really well. And I, I know that relationship's pretty good. And he knows Adam Fletcher pretty well. And I think that's, that's a huge key to me. If I were Kofi knowing what Adam Fletcher has done for me, not just Brad Underwood, but Adam, Adam's been huge in his development. Yeah. I know that internally they're having, I'm sure it's been a dialogue as well with Kofi uh, as far as what Adam could continue to do to help him try to transition to just be NBA ready as much as he's going to be NBA ready while still, you know, trying to be that dominant presence that he's been in college basketball, but help lean him up maybe a little bit more. And I think, that conversation is key as far as, okay, what are we going to do next development wise to try to help Kofi and make this year really beneficial. Um, but also it's going to be, and, and like you said, with Kerbel, I mean, just it, it, regardless of where you put him, as far as is he the third best point guard in the country, he's in that conversation as far as, you know, being up there, but the chemistry that him and Kofi already have in that pick and roll and, and, and just in general, now Ty Ty Washington is a really darn good point guard and being at Kentucky, like, Play with that guy, yeah, he's pretty good. Um, but you you got a good thing going with Curbelo uh, and other it's conversations. The risk assessment for me, yeah. like going somewhere new. Um, I mean, I know that's exciting, but also can create some problems. You know, there's a lot of mouths to feed at Kentucky with with all those guys. And you know, I know Cal is is a great developer of talent. I think he's underrated as a coach. Actually, I know a lot of people don't like to hear that, but you go there and you get better. Uh, most guys, uh, almost all of them, and almost all of them get drafted that want to get drafted. Um, but it's just, you have such a good thing here at, at Illinois. And I think your earning potential is actually potentially higher. Uh, yeah. I, I really think it's higher at Illinois than it would be at Kentucky where, yeah, he's a big name there uh, and he would be good there. No doubt about it, but it's just, it's already built here. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So I, this is me talking. I think if, if everything is rational, which we know it's not always rational, Kofi will come back to college. And if he's coming back to college, I, I just feel like Illinois is, is the most rational place for him to be. It doesn't mean that's, that'll be his decision. Yep. Uh, I'm on the same page as you there as well. It's just going to be, and we're not going to obviously know all of what, what goes on as far as the dialogue, but uh, just the NIL conversation and the, the teams not being able to be those that facilitate the deals, but trying to offer projections and trying to sh- show as much as they can as far as this is what, hey, come to Champaign. This is what you're going to earn. Obviously, Kentucky on the other side, come to Lexington. These are the kind of opportunities that we think you'll be afforded uh, and, and what those numbers are going to look like and what those com- how those conversations will go. I think that is going to be probably the biggest driving force on the decision. I'm not saying the highest number or whatever is going to win, but um, yeah, Illinois has a lot of the other stuff with that. Plus, I mean, very prepared in the NIL front by all indications that I'd say odds are, are, are pretty decent. I gave a three on Kofi and Garcia last week and everybody, not everybody freaked out, but I'm still with that three, four. Hey, hey where are we at? Oh, we got a four. Yeah. Okay, we, well, let's get into Garcia here in a second. Um, but our guy, Michael Tulip, he texted me the other day and he goes, would Kofi be the first All-American to transfer after he got All-American status? He went and did research. He couldn't find it since 1995. Like, since 1995. So, Kofi Coburn, if he transferred from Illinois, transferred out of Illinois, I think he'd literally, like, well, literally, potentially, because he's so big, but he would be one of the biggest transfers in college basketball history. Yeah, I'm glad that Mike did that because I'll be honest with you, it's something that's been in my head and wanting to find that nugget uh, to look it up. Because we think about in college football, the big name transfers like a Justin Fields going from Georgia to Ohio State or Joe Burrow going to Ohio State. LSU. These quarterbacks have not been like Heisman Trophy level or, or in that conversation when they transfer. It's right. the five star that hasn't, hasn't worked out or, or whatever it may be. Maybe Jalen Hurts is the one that, that you would circle, but even in college basketball, yeah, this is something that we've never, never seen, or, or I don't even know who 95 was as far as the transfer. Maybe that, that's just since that's as long as Mike could stay up before he's like, I, I, I haven't found anything. Yeah. I, it just, it's, it's, it's something that like, I think needs to be said. He would be one of the 
most significant players to leave a school after winning all Americaners, maybe the biggest it's um, so if Illinois fans are, are wanting to dig themselves a hole for when, it, if it does happen, like, yeah, this is, this is rarefied air. If, if Kofi Cobra decides to leave, but they're also in on another great transfer Dawson Garcia, which is kind of an independent recruitment right now. And I'm, I, that's an interesting conversation with Illinois. I don't know if they have the conversation with Dawson about Kofi. They play different positions, certainly, and they certainly could help each other. But he's got a final four schools here, Derek. Um, he's down to Illinois, potentially going back to Marquette with new coach Shocker Smart there. Um, Arizona uh, as well, and North Carolina, which was uh, among the schools recruiting him as a high school recruit. And North Carolina, most everybody outside the program seems to think they're the favorite, and why wouldn't they? They're a blue blood. Uh, but uh, just where do you think Illinois stands as, as Dawson Garcia is taking these visits? And I would imagine a decision has to come in the coming days and weeks. I would expect last I heard that Illinois is in a pretty good spot. And uh, the fact that he did take another visit after North Carolina, I, I just think that as far as Arizona goes, unless they blew him away on the visit or something really changed there, I wouldn't expect them to be in that final, that final decision. It seemed like. Don't first... underestimate Stephen Gentry as a recruiter here, Derek. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I like Steven. He's great. I like Steven too. Well, Steven's at Gonzaga, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's at Gonzaga. I was thinking Tommy yeah. Lloyd. Okay, there yeah. Was... Right. All right. I, I totally, totally whiffed on that one. It's um, all good. There was yeah. talk about Arizona one time. Yeah. Um, no, I, I was thinking, I was thinking Tommy Lloyd, Gonzaga, and so totally. Yeah. So that, that's not even going to cut that out. I'm just going to own that whiff. <laughs> um, North Carolina, Armando Baycott. Uh, Brady Manick in the transfer from Oklahoma. So they've got some more, they've got established pieces in their front court with Baycott and then Manick is, was a nice four-year player at Oklahoma. So there's competition there. As far as Illinois sell, it's mostly Garcia playing the four. Uh, I know that he was viewed as a guy that would be in the mix of the five when Payne wasn't on the floor. Not that you want him guarding a Hunter Dickinson. Trevion um, Williams. Trevion Williams, because he's, he's rather slender. And while, the Kofi Georgie marriage didn't work out with both playing at the same time a whole lot. I mean, it, it had its moments. Dawson's already shown, you know, playing off the dribble, shooting the three. I wouldn't worry about, oh, uh -oh we're playing Kofi with another big man and that's not going to work. Dawson can actually space the floor. And I think that it, I wouldn't see any reason why one decision would affect the other all that much, in my opinion. Because, I mean, anywhere he'd go, right? I mean, North Carolina's got some good bigs. Um, they got some good front court players. Arizona's got some good front court players. Maybe Marquette would be like, if you want to be the star, he obviously was the star at Marquette. It'd just be uh, for a different coaching staff. So, um, yeah, I mean, the two can play together. Um, so it, this is just a very interesting time, Derek, because you could go from, as we said before, like your front court is really lacking. Like you got some pieces, but you don't know much about them. You'd be counting on potentially a Benjamin Bossman's Verdon to make an impact or to play Jacob Grandison a lot again at the four, which I, I don't think is ideal though. He can obviously play it. Um, or you could have one of the best front courts in the country, if not the best front court in the country, or you have one of them come, come to you. And if you get Kofi or you get Dawson Garcia, I think going to a top 25 caliber team. Yeah. If you get both of them, I think you're a top five team in the country, most likely in my opinion. Uh, and then if one of them, your ranked team, you're still competing in that top echelon of the Big Ten. Uh, and, and I guess one thing I might say about Garcia viewing Kofi there, like when Kofi was in on that team, obviously last year, Illinois top five most post touches in the country. So like the volume of, of the amount of time they throw the ball inside to Kofi or just run the pick and roll with Kofi, maybe that would take away some of the opportunities that Garcia would have as a pick and pop, as a uh, just the amount of looks you're going to get. But like you, as you highlighted, some of those other places have some very talented big men as well. And if Illinois, wanted, Illinois fans want to dream a little dream, I mean, you can be really freaking good if you get both those guys. I, I'm going to say I would expect only one. You'd only get one. But, man, if you get one, like you, it just completely changes your season. So I, you could dream the little dream. But, like, if you just get one of those guys, um, this is this is a legit Big Ten contender, uh, in my opinion, because I, I think people under overlook a little bit 
just how important it is to get DeMonte and Trent back. Um, what those guys mean with Andre Curbelo and with Alfonso Plummer. I mean, that that's a really good backcourt uh, in its own regard. And obviously you've got some younger guys that, that maybe at some point can make uh, an impact. And, you know, I think DeMonte really – helps with the defensive uh, assignments you might have to have with bigger guards. So I think he gets overlooked, especially, but you got some, you got some bucket getters, you got some offense back there and Trent and DeMonte are really good defenders. Omar Payne's a versatile piece. It's just, you had one more piece to that front court along with Jacob Grandison and Omar Payne and, and Coleman Hawkins. Uh, and, and these aren't just a, a piece, right? These, these are college basketball stars, one and all American and one, who's got the potential to potentially be an all big 10 player as well. And, and Dawson Garcia. So a lot can change uh, in, in this next couple of weeks with these two. After an insane off season, <laughs> what, if, what if July was where Illinois really just, we, some things, some dominoes fall here. Let's say Kofi comes back and like you highlight, I mean, not only would you just have this physical monster inside, you got Curbelo as that facilitating wizard. There's a lot of shooters too. Like, Trent, Plummer, uh, Hutcherson, if he's DeMonte. healthy, DeMonte, Grandison, Pods is going to be able to make buckets as a freshman. Uh, Coleman Hawkins, I would imagine him. <laughs> it's just 36 three. minutes to talk about Austin Hutcherson. Hey, right? like, there it is. He goes back to the X factor rather than like, yeah. this guy better be good and he better be healthy. Like, I think we both think he could be really good, yeah. uh, but it's just, he's, he's got to be healthy. Um, you know, if you don't get either of these guys, Austin Hutcherson and Jacob Grandison are going to have to play huge, huge roles. If not, they're potential role players for you. And, and those guys are pretty good role players. Yeah. That's the spot you want to be uh, as far as a team and just kind of the outlook. But uh, those that maybe were skeptical of Chester have, have been shown that hey this guy's pretty darn good you get some more clarity on the, the third assistant the staff maybe it's all going to be all right in Atlanta maybe, Atlanta. maybe it's all going to be okay you know i've been saying that i think illinois basketball will be fine that, that's been my hot take like they'll be fine um if you get kofi or dawson garcia you're certainly fine if you get both of them it's one of the best teams in the country so yeah there there are a lot of ways that I think Illinois basketball could go a lot, through a lot of struggles if they don't get Garcia or Coburn, but I think those struggles are still competing for the NCAA tournament and, and competing for the top half of the Big Ten. But if you land one of those guys, if, if you're going from one seed down to a four or five or six seed, like that's that's what you want Illinois basketball to be, and that'd be a heck of a rebound uh, for Brad Underwood and company. Yep, it really would be. It really would be. And I think that, again, I mean, you get Kobe back, I, I think – you'd have every reason to be a four or five seed. Like at, that, that should be seems the like expectation, the right? That seems like the four. Four, yeah. Like I, I think that team should be a, a top 25 team all year. If you have Kofi Coburn, Andre Curbelo, Trent Frazier, Demonte Williams, Austin Hutcherson, Jacob Grandison, Coleman, all, you know what I mean? Omar Payne. Like okay. that's, that's a really good and old Big Ten team that like that's what I look at Purdue this year. Like, but – Trevion Williams to Kofi Coburn. I'll take Kofi Coburn. Andre Cabello, Jaden Ivey. Maybe, maybe that's a, a toss up because I, I, Jaden Ivey was unbelievable at the end of last year. But like th those are two top 15 teams, I, yeah. I think. And I, I would expect Illinois to, to be a four or five. Like that would be my floor when, you know, the, the ceiling, if you win the Big Ten or you're, you're a one or a two. Yep. And a lot of depth behind that, that those headliners and, and a Kofi and Curbelo if it is to happen. Absolutely. We can dream a little dream here in July, Derek. Well, Derek, uh, you're heading down uh, to, to Birmingham, I believe, this week. Uh, tell the people about the coverage you'll have with the July recruiting period. It's back after yeah. a year absence. How you feeling? Oh, it's, it's going to be great. Long drive down south, but we'll get that thing done. Adidas will be in Birmingham. Jay Neps is going to be there. Uh, Sincere Harris as well, the new commit. And then you got a lot going on in Atlanta as well. You got Under Armour, where you see Jaden Shute, Braden Huff, a number of other guys. And then there's some EYBL teams at an Elite 32 event. So just a, a lot of daily coverage we will have. Uh, notes, scouting reports, buzz, of course, that we'll uh, you get to mingle with the coaches and, and some other people, AAU coaches. This is the best time to get out and, and really talk to people, uh, get those in-person interviews uh, with the players. So uh, there will be a lot coming to Atlanta Inquirer as we, we hit the road. 
man, uh, enjoy the trip, Derek. And I feel like we're going to have a lot to talk about when we get on this next week. I might have to call you for an emergency pod at some point this week with, with what could happen. Pull off at probably like a Love's gas station and uh, we can talk Kofi on the seventh. Uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll play do, by ear, but do you have like a gas station rankings? Like, do you have a go-to like, you know, that's, I kind of do. I, I'm always try. I'm always targeting the loves. Uh, th that's what I really enjoy. Uh, as far as it's like a truck stop gas station or, or travel center. Cause you know, you got, you're not waiting in line for the bathroom there. You just got a lot of options in and out, uh, get your, your drink, whatever you need. So uh, that's where I, that's where I'm at. I'm, I'm at, I'm trying to think the other ones, but that I'm always hunting out the loves. All right. Derek Piper loves men. If we learned anything from this podcast, people will remember that. Derek Piper. Thank you, man. Safe travels. Thank you, man. Appreciate it.